Hello and welcome to another episode Hi. of Laying Down the Lore 40k, a lore podcast in which we aim to separate our Dukari from our Dark Angels, our Tyranids from our Tau, and our Craft Worlds from our Chaos Marines. I generally ask what's up with this Warhammer 40k stuff. And genuinely ask what's up with Darren and his incessant interrupting of intros. <laughs> my name is Ben Crone Barber and I know pretty much fuck all about 40k. With me is my co-host Christopher Crallen Allen. Yes, yes I am here, yes. Who knows absolutely fuck all about 40k. Yes, I know fuck all about 40k, yes. And my dear asshole of a brother Darren. Get in it! <laughs> he knows so much about 40k, it's a wonder he has time to do anything else. Over the years, this dichotomy between our levels of understanding became clear, and this series is an attempt to address that ignorance. To address that dichotomy. Yay. Yay. Man, we finally managed to get through the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Despite constant resistance and distraction. Uh, I believe it's called non-consent, Ben. It's, I, yep, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> Good boy. Ben, what do you think? Do you think we will ever do any intro of any of our shows without Darren turning into a 12-year-old? Yeah, yeah, turning into a 12-year-old. No, exactly. No, I don't, no, 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 no. I mean, no, look at him. No, he's, no. He's, uh, he's on the brink of a full dar. And, and oh, mate, mate, you wouldn't want to. Imagine a dull intro. <laughs> it's the foreplay to content. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just let's get through the fucking thing and get into the meat and veg, <laughs> said the vicar. <laughs> That's why I think i got a good idea of why you don't get on with women, Ben. <laughs> <sighs> right, moving on. Hi. What did we... Hi, hello there, <laughs> Kral. Before we uh, before we move yes, on, mate. would you like to um, would you like to word merge space halflings for me? Sparflings. Excellent. Okay. And what Next. did we learn? <laughs> and what did we learn last week? Uh, last week? Last month? Last? Oh God! Last episode. I don't know. According to Darren's blurb, we looked at the kingdom within the Imperium, the techno-feudal sociopaths of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Curse, 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 curse. <laughs> Is that a title you just rolled off the top of your head? Yeah, I literally had no idea. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna recite this. We delved into their origins, their motivations, their love for the knee healing emperor. I do remember that about the last Oh yeah. It was a bit spoony. Bit spoony and a bit gallery. That's it, exactly. He's just like, bam, your knee's healed. And then Adeptus Mechanicus just lost their shit over that. They were like, oh my God, he <laughs> yeah. fixed a robotic knee. And then they just kind <laughs> of, that spoons. was it. Yeah, exactly. I'm sold. <laughs> He's blatantly omniscient and omnipotent. So yeah, over to you. What else happened, Ben? Fuck. That's oh, right. Yeah, so, we also so, looked at their political status within the Imperium and their hate-hate relationship with the Ecclesiarchy. Yep, that's right. That's yeah. right, yeah. And they used yeah. to be called the Mechanicum. And then when the Horacy happened, you know, it was Ew. all a bit sticky. All got a bit sticky. And then the Horacy <laughs> the Horacy? <laughs> the, the Harris Horacy. The Horacy. Um, <laughs> Dr. Zeus. Dr. And then Zeus when the exactly evil happened, Horacy. Yeah. Who's uh, a Horacy or Harris? Horace? Who's? And then and then Horace Potter showed up and um, basically used the, the mechanic come. He used the force. <laughs> the the mechanic come split into the Adeptus Mechanic Curse because they became incorporated more into. Uh, was it the Fabricator General became one of the High Lords of Terra at that point? And then 100%. So they became uh, a Departmento, which is a funky mint. And they took the name mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Adeptus Mechanicus which is more inclusive, as we discussed. And then the other half of them became the Dark Mechanicum. And I think there was another offshot, which were called the Her Heretech. Yep. Yes, Heretech, no. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Chris. This is an amazing recap. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with myself. I'm pretty <laughs> pleased with myself. Go on, Ben. <laughs> There was some there was some machines and stuff. Um Yeah. Yeah. Knights and Titans, big old uh ex farming agricultural machinery. Oh got. yeah, war farmers. Yeah. War. Get them missiles out there, you bastards. I yeah, would yeah, play yeah. that game, War Farmers. <laughs> so um yeah, that was it. War farmers. Mm. Anything else, Kral? Anything else? Yeah, all in all, a pretty head? dull episode. So let's see if Darren can <laughs> spice things up this week, I think. Right? 
I, I'm going to say unfair because that I actually really enjoyed that episode. Oh, Darren's flexing now. He's like, I'm going to space Marines your yeah. ass. I'm trying to get, around. spoiler, <laughs> I'm trying to get, well, it's going to be in all the marketing material, isn't it? So, hardly a spoiler. <laughs> What's this episode? The hidden episode that doesn't have a title for each individual until two minutes in. <laughs> Darren's going to do space Marines. Darren does space what? Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Let me imagine. tell you, uh, ben, it would explain ben. why I'm so tired. <laughs> Ben, why why did you ask me about space halflings at the beginning of the show? Any revel, relevance or relevance? It's a funny word. Have you been it? on that little person's dating app again? I mean, <laughs> Spafflings is a great name. I mean, it's it's a great name. I know you should go, no, all, all, all joking aside, you should go on that dating app for little people. I think it's called Thumble. I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> Thimble. <laughs> <laughs> that is a Bobby Lee joke. For anyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> this episode, we're going to look at the poster boys, literally boys, of the Warhammer 40k game. The Space Marines of the Adeptus Astartes. Now, Rumble! We have discussed these lads previously during the Horus Heresy. And we talked about the original 20 legions, which went down to 18. And how there was, let's call it a disagreement between one half of the Imperium and the other half. And they kind of mediated it through total warfare and violence. And then ultimately, Horacy was uh, basically pimp slapped by the Emperor while he was able to cut the Emperor's throat at the same time. Done. Moving on. Let's pick up from there. Yeah. About seven years after the Emperor was interned into the Golden Throne, Robuti Guliman presented uh, the Codex Astartes to the High Lords of Terra and also the other Primarchs. This book, which uh, radically revised how a Space Marine army is organized, how it operates, what tactics, it's, what tactics it uses, was drawn almost exclusively from the experience of the heresy itself. If you're an elite super soldier, the worst foe you can face is another elite super soldier. Uh, and they went through that uh, kind of crucible and now have uh, a series of tactics uh, with which to combat such a threat. So not only did it uh, look at how um, space marines could fight and how they would engage uh, specific enemies in kind of generic situations, it, what it also did was it got rid of space marine legions as a whole. Now, listeners will recall, uh, space marine legions uh, ranged in size from 70 to 90,000 to several hundred thousand, although I've heard a rumor someone said millions. I, I can't confirm or deny that. Um, billions. Billions. I think it was billions. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, it was decided that uh, for the security of the Imperium and the mortally wounded Emperor, Space Marine Legions could no longer exist at that size. They needed to be vastly reduced um, but they still needed to be an effective fighting force so really that's what the Codex Astartes um, set out that was its kind of uh, mission uh, how to uh, marry a, a reduced but effect, yeah, a reduced uh, but a still effective fighting force and a range of tactics that that smaller force could use against larger uh, groups of opponents. Mr. Ben. Um, so this was done in order to uh, kind of safeguard against another instance of rebellion like you had in the, the heresy. Is that yes. right? Yes. Of that scale. Of that scale. Of that scale, yeah. yeah. So how would that have worked as a, as a safeguard? Because surely all of the... So it went from legions to chapters, is that yeah. right? Yeah. And a chapter is, what, a thousand... Marines? Have you been reading up on this? I thought you knew fuck all about 40k. 
you've taught you've i think you mentioned this i did yeah i did episodes. i did <laughs> okay yeah thank god right, okay. i thought i was learning something um <laughs> those chapters are they not then do they no longer have primarchs like the primarchs that still that survived the heresy are they still in charge of collections of chapters no after the end, after the adoption of the Codex Astartes, a Primarch was in charge of the initial. We'll use the Ultramarines as an example. There's a, an, a piece of in lore literature called the Apocrypha of Scaros, which details uh, 23 uh, new chapters drawn from the Ultramarines. Now, you will recall this was the one I got. Um, I misspoke on the the Ultramarines had four hundred and fifty thousand battle brothers, like warriors in good standing. That's enough to make four hundred and fifty chapters. So the twenty three is not a complete list. When those uh, let us stick for the sake of argument with those twenty three, when those twenty three were pulled out. Uh, each of them was their own force that did not answer to the Ultramarines, but acknowledged uh, uh, Guliman as the Primarch, as their Primarch. So they would take some traits and tactics from the Ultramarines as taught by uh, their Primarch. So it would instruct the way that they examined problems, the way they fought, this kind of thing. But the Primarch was not in charge of those chapters. Gurleyman, sorry, a girly man. Gurleyman was in charge of the Ultramarines. So his army went from 450,000, you know, at peak, down to 1,000. Right. Okay. So, so, the, so there is literally a chapter, a single 1,000 Marine chapter called the Ultramarines. Yes. Right. And then the other 450 or 449 or whatever, they're all yeah. separate entities that are not under the command of a Primarch. Exactly right. Yes. So, who are they under the command of, and who, like, yeah, who do they answer to? Is there any way that they could be corralled into a rebellion again? Corralled? They could be corralled. <laughs> corralled. In- I think we can all be corralled into a rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that really uh, touches back to the structure of a Space Marine Legion. Each Legion will stick with the Ultramarines. The Ultramarines Legion is a single huge force comprised of different chapters. And their chapters are roughly a thousand Battle Brothers. It's important to note the distinction between Battle Brothers and Space Marines, because that's going to come up later. Uh, A chapter will have a thousand Battle Brothers, but will have more Space Marines than that, because there's support roles and command roles and specialist roles. So each chapter within a legion uh, was led by a lieutenant commander. And that's who took command of each chapter as they went forward. So an entire chapter would be sloughed off of the legion as a distinct fighting force and given a new name and a new heraldry and sent on its way uh, either as a crusading chapter. These are space-based ones. It's fleet-based or as uh, one that was attached to a specific world and thus was responsible for the safety of the an area of space around that. Why? Right. Okay. Did they ever team up? Like if they were fighting a foe that was maybe bigger? All the time. Gotcha. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for like the Battle of Armageddon, there was something like 29 Space Marine chapters. Not in totality. Some would send a couple of companies. Some turned up their entire force uh, but those kinds of battles are fought all the time in the gotcha. in, in the world of 40k okay. so a chapter is commanded by a lord commander and then the battalions each have a lieutenant commander uh, in charge of those 500 um uh, battle brothers and then each Battalion is comprised of five companies, and a company is 100 Battle Brothers uh, plus supporting units. Um, When the change happened, uh, or what the proposed change was, is that they'd get rid of the battalion structure, so it would just be the chapter and then 10 companies. 
and each company was relatively self-sufficient, although they covered separate things. But we'll we'll cover that now. In fact, um, <laughs> <laughs> so when these chapters were founded, it was uh, under the direction of Rubusiguliman and the High Lords of Terra. Now, not all of the other Primarchs approved of this or even wanted to do it. Uh, some ignored it completely, like the Space Wolves. They have their own organization, which kind of roughly gets to about a thousand Battle Brothers. And that was really how a lot of these chapters were able to retain their identity, their Primarch's identity and the identity they got from the planet or the world where they were founded. Uh, as long as they were able to keep it to roughly a thousand Battle Brothers, uh, you know, plus minus a few, it was all good. The uh, driving force was to get each distinct space marine force down to a thousand strong so that if their leader rebelled against the Imperium, it wouldn't be a Horus. It would be a, like a minor warlord that they would be able to dispatch relatively easily, uh, or so they hoped. Do the chapters that come from an original Legion have any sort of relation to that like is it the the so-and-so chapter of the ultramarines is it the so-and-so chapter of the space worlds even though they get new names and new heraldry they they are referred is literally what i was about to say they are referred to as the successor chapters they succeed the role that that legion uh played and they're taking on uh, a new role identified to the specific need of the Imperium at that time. So those are referred to as the second founding. So the first founding was the original 20 legions. The second founding is nine of those legions breaking up into chapters. The traitor legions do not follow that model. Clearly, what we're about to discuss today the, the the traitor legions never bothered. They recruit differently. They're organized differently, uh, and some, in fact, retain the the structure of the Space Marine Legions, the original Space Marine Legions. So the successor chapters, it's really a flip of a coin. A lot of them do venerate, like uh, so, thousands of years later. Say the successor chapters are still going. They do venerate their primarch. They do. Uh, idolize the original like um, Space Marine legions that they're drawn from, but they are their own distinct force with their own distinct history, command structure, uh, and tactics. Um, so they are they are effectively grown up the grown up kids of the Space Marine legions is what chapters have become, and so there have been uh, many foundings after that. So you're looking at, you know, there's a second founding. Uh, uh, pretty quickly after that, there was a third founding and so on and so on and so on. There are some quite famous foundings, which we'll deal with uh, towards the end of the episode, uh, including the Dark Founding, uh, which I think was done at night. That's clearly why it was named that. <laughs> so uh, I thought it might be helpful uh, from there to dive into <laughs> what the structure of a Space Marine chapter is uh, based on the Codex Astartes. So you have effectively 10 companies of 100 Space Marines, and they are broken out into uh, specific uh, roles. The first company is the veteran company. Those are the, the, the ones that have, in general, lasted the longest in battle. Uh, they have great tactical They're acumen. Old. They're older. Uh, not really necessarily old. always back the in oldest day. in the back in my day. <laughs> the, the dwarves of the Space Marines, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Still using um, muskets. But these are the ones that are, if you need an objective captured in difficult circumstances, these are the guys you send in. They come in kind of three flavors, really. You've got uh, what's referred to as Stern Guard veterans, uh, and these are kind of quite dour. They sound fun. Yeah. Um, but these would be the, if you can imagine what a special forces unit of Space Marines would be like, that's what they are. You then have the Vanguard uh, veterans, which are the same troops, but with jump packs. 
uh, specializing in close quarter combat. And then you have the quite iconic Terminators. Oh, These yeah. are the huge hulking, it's walking you know, almost v- vehicular armor level, uh, well, armor, uh, as they- and They all have uh, Bavarian accents. Yeah, <laughs> Bavarian. <laughs> I'll be back. Are the Dreadnoughts in First Company as well then? because Dreadnoughts are in every company. Oh, they're in every company, right, okay. Yeah. So uh, every company has uh, support uh, equipment and vehicles, uh, either Rhino APC carriers, so uh, armored personnel carriers, or heavier kind of tanks with troop carrying capacity, like the Land Raiders. These are the kind of iconic vehicles. Growl, uh, they're not real the... Rhinos, I can see on your face. Ah, oh, yeah, that would sorry. be much better. M- rhino mounts. <laughs> It should happen. How are we? How are we back to mounting animals again? That's <laughs> mm, mm. uh, what Warhammer is basically all about, right? Yeah. Just, <laughs> just mounts. mounting this and that. Yeah, it's a code word, Warhammer. Yeah. The next, so that's the first company. Then companies two through five are what's referred to as battle companies. These are uh, the kind of self-sufficient military forces that can go on extended campaigns. So the 100 uh, space marines within a battle company are 60 tactical marines. That's the bog standard space marine that from all the imagery that you will have seen. 20 assault marines. These are marines specializing in close quarters combat uh, and can take jetpacks to get into uh, combat quicker. And then you have 20 Devastator Marines. These are the guys that carried the kind of tank-busting heavy weapons uh, that the uh, Marines have access to. Everything from effectively a handheld heavy grenade launcher uh, up to a LAS cannon uh, and plasma cannons, this kind of idea. So that if it's just infantry they can go toe-to-toe with a significantly larger force, regardless of how well-armoured that other force is. Each battle company has an associated kind of leadership with it. Uh, Each company is led by a captain, and battle companies, in general, are also attached uh, a chaplain, who is there for their their spiritual well-being, Sometimes a librarian. Uh, Sounds very progressive, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, a librarian who is, in fact, the psychers. We've, we've talked about these guys previously. And then they will have a tech marine. Again, we've talked about them previously. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. space marine who was trained by the Adeptus Mechanicus to be able to... Uh, Wield re- glow sticks. <laughs> no, that's a techno <laughs> marine. <Ben. laughs> Topless chewing gum all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, party boys. Uh, With tiny, tiny circular glasses. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then the last attached kind of specialist is an apothecary, a medic, uh, to uh, try and uh, keep their forces alive. Kiss those boo-boos better. (laughs) Sometimes literally, Kral. I know you made a joke, but that's literally true. Sometimes you just need a kiss on the boo-boo. Nothing chafes more than scraping your knee along the floor, man. Space Marine or not. That bucket hurts. <laughs> and there's only one cure for that. Magic kisses. Magic kisses. I'd be, I'd so be again, some impact if you scraped your knee through power armor. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I tripped and Ouch. fell out of owie. an airplane. I did an owie. <laughs> <laughs> Onto a planet. <laughs> yeah. Foomp. <laughs> Onto a badly placed mountain. It's like that bit in Halo where uh, the Master Chief skydives through an atmosphere to land in a planet. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is uh, quite the achievement. <laughs> and also the wrong IP. And also it doesn't scrape his knee, you know. This guy knows what he's doing. Well, you wouldn't know even if he <laughs> did because he's badass. Yeah. <laughs> Just limps a bit. I'm fine. No, it's cool. I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just walk it off. Exactly. So in addition to their their battle brothers, again, these guys have associated uh, vehicles. They have the armored personnel carrier and the kind of tanky personnel carrier. They also have, as Ben mentioned, dreadnoughts. Now, a dreadnought is a walking weaponized life support system. It is about the size of a 
minibus. Or in fact, two minibuses, one on top of the other. Uh, and Lengthways or like stacked like that? Stacked. We're talking stacked, vertically? Yeah. So two minibuses kind of on the, you know... On top of each other, yeah. But <laughs> one is mounted the other. Um, but are they, are they <laughs> like lengthways? Are they standing up? Is no, you as you would see them on a road, take one minibus and place another minibus on top of it. Oh, wow, right, okay. So it's, in effect, there's a coffin with the remains of a space marine put in, still alive, usually in an amniotic sack with loads of cables and wires plugged in, keeping him alive. Um, Amniotic's not a nice word, is it? (laughs) That coffin is then placed in a effectively a robot, uh, but it's a robot that's controlled by the uh, space marine, space marine in a box in a box. Uh, And then that... (laughs) That robot is a walking powerhouse of death and destruction, uh, armed either with close combat weapons that can tear vehicles in two or long-range weapons that can uh, shoot a halfling uh, out of the sky at three miles away. A space halfling. Challenge accepted. Um, So it's a human remains in a bag, in a box, in a box, in a weapon. (laughs) Yes, Covered in Jägen mouth, too. It's like the Russian <laughs> doll of Space Marines. <laughs> it's the Matrush, it's the evil Matrushka doll, yeah. Uh, well, I am going to ask, but I think I know the answer. Why would you put a uh, decrepit, half dead, or almost dead Space Marine in a war machine when you could put a capable Space Marine in there? However, the capable Space Marine is probably more self sufficient because they've still got their limbs and working facilities, so they're probably more effective. If you put a space moon, he's still got the will, but not the mobility. You could still make use of them. They get a second wind, I guess. So, yeah, well done, Crowley. Oh, I don't. Sometimes <laughs> I don't know why you even bother turning up, Dar. I mean, we've got this. <laughs> Crowley's got this. Crowley's got this. I don't think about that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of to add a little bit extra detail to your to your self answer there, Chris. In general, it is heroes of the chapter. So these are. Towering figures of experience and, and leadership who um, the chapter deems that they need that experience retained. They need that wisdom and advice within the chapter still. Yeah, okay. uh, so it's really the last chance for the that space marine to serve the chapter. Gotcha. I mean, it's a thing perhaps I should have opened up with. I think we mentioned it during the heresy episodes. These are warrior monks. They have a complete faith in the rule of the emperor and the kind of sanctity of their uh, primarchs. Almost all chapters are uh, secular. So they are, they are in fact continuing the emperor's original vision for the Imperium. Uh, The idea that there are no gods, no monsters, humanity above all. These guys, while portrayed as the, good guys within the company and the marketing and so forth are extreme fascists when it comes to service to the Imperium. No, space marines in general. Oh, Oh, in general, Uh, right, okay. And and thus, when if they're mortally wounded, they regret not being able to continue the fight. So if they're given a chance, they happily would go into an amniotic sack uh, and then... uh, Can we stop saying that? Amniotic. <laughs> it makes me want to have a shower. Makes you feel filthy. So with these battle companies, steering it back to, to that, they do have some light vehicles as well. Um, they had uh, bikes, these big, huge uh, motorbikes that the assault uh, marines could ride, but also they have something called an attack bike, which is the same type of bike, with a, a very lightly armoured sidecar on it that has an extremely heavy machine gun called a heavy bolter attached to the front. So they can mow down forces uh, as they're driving around the place. They also have access to something called a land speeder. This is a, how would you describe it? It's a ho- an armoured hover car with aforementioned heavy bolter stuck to the front. There are various flavours of those, Uh, They can be uh, kitted out with uh, missile launchers, with rotary cannons on the front, this kind of idea, so they can provide heavy weapon support for fast-moving troops. 
are the, does does the vehicle have to point in the same direction that the gun is firing? Can the guns aim separately, independently? The guns have about 120 degrees of uh, kind of range, field of fire uh, okay. towards the front, Mr. Right. Chris. And does the force of firing a heavy bolt gun slow them down if they're hovering as well? I would no. have thought <laughs> inertia, momentum, no. firepower. They have these things called suspensors. Okay. Uh, suspenders. Which is a, a little Bring device back, that you attach to <laughs> you attach to a piece of equipment. It's effectively a small anti anti grav engine that makes the thing lighter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Like the uh, Good cradle on my mic, up as well. mic holder. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yep. 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 There are also um kind of uh, void craft, spaceship associated with each of the battle companies as well. There's a strike cruiser, which is quite a heavily armed um, uh, void craft associated with the Space Marines, and it can hold an entire company uh, and get them to where they need to be. So very much you want to think about the Space Marines as like the Ameri- the US Marines. The US Marines have access to everything except naval assets to take them somewhere. Or rather, the U.S. Marines don't have their own ships. They have, they have to go uh, with the American Navy. So that's really the only difference. The, you know, and it com- besides being completely fictitious, the Space Marines and have their, space. their own... Yeah, yeah and, they're, and have and their they own ships. Venom, and they've got uh, two hearts. And they can eat the brains and absorb the memories you and abilities. You're still not over that, are you, big guy? <laughs> oh no, it's, it's, it's amazing. What's the ratio in a chapter of Marines to kind of auxiliary staff? Is that what they're called? Like non non Marini people. Um, so are you talking about the libra- librarians as well? And no, 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 no. So like, let's say a chapter is a thousand Marines, which includes all of that. How many humans? Not transhumans, is that what they call them? Transhumans? Abhumans. Like, yeah, transhumans, ab, yeah. Ab, ab, no, abhumans no. are mutants. Okay. Yeah, transhumans are, are uh, yeah. evolved. So yeah, a thousand marines. How many other people? So each space marine chapter probably has about 1,100 marines, including all the extra bits that we'll cover uh, in the next few minutes. Um, in terms of uh, servitors, they will have tens of thousands of servitors. Then you get into actual human servants, um, equerries, that kind of idea. They will have probably the same number, probably another 10,000 uh, so human assistants, in quotes. A, a substantially higher number of support auxiliary staff to support several hundred space marines. Is that the math? Is that the is that the right ratio? That's roughly about it. About about a hundred auxiliary staff per um, space marine. Per uh, space marine. That's oh wait, no, I've done it again. I've got my math wrong. <laughs> about somewhere between twenty and thirty non space marines per space marine. Right. Yeah, that seems really weird. Why does that seem weird? Um, why would you need so you, you many have people? To re- why, why, why does why does one space marine need like an entourage of twenty other people? I've got this. Can't just hold my beer. So, is it because the marines are almost like knights of the kind of medieval era, like when they were kind of going out to battle? They had to have they couldn't put their own armor on because it's fucking huge. A ward. So they had to have. Yeah, exactly. A ward. So it's or kind of like they were like people. 20 wards <laughs> but you're talking about power armor do you know what i mean it's not just a standard armor crowd you need you need wards you need wardy wards you need the wards of wards even the wards need wards that's that's how crazy exponential wards go okay, okay cool yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah what you also have to keep in mind is that half of those non-astartes non-space marine troops are servitors are monotask servitors so these will be uh, things that will produce one thing or manage one thing, uh, including storing the armor, cleaning the armor, that kind of idea, uh, cleaning the weapons, um, painting the armor, 
Well, there's another difference between your traditional marine versus a space marine. Like a traditional marine would fucking take care of themselves. They don't need 20 people going out to them in the middle of the fucking Southeast Asian jungle to support them and clean their armor, do they? They're fucking <laughs> clean it themselves. Because <laughs> they're seem, fucking marines. You seem disgusted by this. Like. Yeah. yeah. Just the inefficiency of the Imperium of Man, but I think that's the point, right? Yeah, that's, it's kind of the point, but also space marines have almost no downtime. They're constantly, if they're not at war, they're training to be at war uh, or eating their dinner in a war style, which sure. I don't know. Screaming. Ah, ah, yeah. And shooting someone. Yeah, exactly right. Eating, eating their dinner while watching a war documentary on Netflix. <laughs> eating their dinner, watching a war documentary about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watching the highlights of the war they were just in. <laughs> so so that's really the, the those. That's the battle companies, which are the kind of self-sufficient strike forces of the Space Marine chapters. You then get into what's referred to as the reserve chapters, or sorry, reserve companies. You have two hundred Marine tactical reserve chapters or res- i've done it again you have two 100 marine tactical reserve companies you then have an assault company made up completely of assault marines a devastator company made up completely of devastator marines and then a scout company made up of recruits made up of the trainees and these are the space marine scouts um so that's another. That's the other five hundred uh, space marines. Then you get into a, rec- a reclusiarchy. Is that the correct term? Reclusiarchy, uh, and that is the kind of chaplain. It just doesn't go outside. Doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't interact with anyone. <laughs> no, that's the reclusiarchy, which it might be actually. That's where the chaplains are, are trained, and and where. The the chaplains go to learn their art. You've got a librarius where the psychers, uh, the uh, also known as Psyker Grove, obviously. Psyker You've Grove. got an apothecary. Psyker Grove, Darren. You've got to see it. Psyker Grove. All the Marines are trained. Uh, and then you've got the, the actual chapter command itself. Plus, for that, more vehicular assets, uh, like specific types of tanks, like the Predator tank, um, and then aircraft, and then all under the kind of purview of the armory, which looks after not only the vehicles, but the weapons and the armor of the Space Marines as well. They'll hold your car keys safe too. Just, you know, I mean, it's part of the service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good valet valet service. So each chapter of the second founding was effectively a jigsaw piece taken out of a larger force uh, and it was fully formed. It already existed. Uh, they perhaps needed to rebalance some aspects of it because you had, uh, for instance, like whole companies of Terminators uh, in the, or whole chapters of Terminators in the Space Marine Legion, where now those veteran troops, were, you would only have a hundred of them uh, in a Space Marine chapter. Um, oh, sorry, when you say when you say jigsaw piece, do you do you mean that like the chapter was a miniaturized version of the Legion structure? No, the chapter already existed within the Legion structure, ah, and so it was pulled out wholesale uh, in many cases, but then had to be tweaked in line with the kind of diktats of the Codex Astartes. So, in general, then. A space marine chapter is a single cohesive force that is able to go anywhere in the galaxy, anywhere within the Imperium of Man and beyond, fuck shit up, and then go back to being on patrol or head back, back to their to, home world. Back to HQ for tea and biscuits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tea and biscuits. And corpse starch and biscuits. Yeah. That was the situation at the second founding. From the third founding onwards, they were only possible with the approval of the High Lords of Terra. So that High Council had to approve the creation of several Space Marine chapters at once. And in terms of what's involved in that, you have to get 
12 of the most arrogant, stubborn humans that have ever existed to acknowledge that a threat or a gap is so significant that it needs to be filled. And the only way to do that is to create a force they have little to no control over that could destroy them quite easily. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So they would need to create, they would need to find uh, recruits, modify them with the uh, the appropriate surgeries, um, create via the Mechanicus all of the vehicles, all of the spaceships, all of the weapons, all of the armor. Then they would need to go through uh, a process of stress testing and conditioning. All of the officers would need to be selected from either from chapters that donate officers, which has happened in the past, or enough time has passed through training that officers have been identified. And then they need to be put into a single fighting force and sent off to wherever they need to be sent off to. Simples. Six, between 60 to 100 years after the agreement to create a Space Marine chapter, that Space Marine chapter appears on the front lines. It is not an insignificant task and takes the cooperation of, you know, the, the, the cooperation required from the Mechanicum alone would bankrupt entire worlds uh, in terms of what the actual cost would be in credits if it was managed that way. Um, That's mental. I have a question about, you know, you said that the first company within a chapter is the veterans. Yep. Does yes. that mean that the the members of the companies change? Because surely, like, you know, I don't know, a tactical marine from chap uh, from company three might get to the point where they hit the threshold of veteran. Are they then moved to company one? Uh Yes, but it's not an automatic thing. Each chapter will have its own uh, criteria for what counts as a veteran. Uh, and some chapters, like the Space Wolves, it requires the approval of a great many of the veterans that already exist to agree to have that person join in. So it needs to be a Marine in good standing. Uh, and in general, the path is, there are exceptions, but in general, your first station in uh, fighting, in joining a Space Marine chapter, is you're the scout. So these are relatively lightly armoured teenagers, for want of a better phrase, that are sent out into uh, battle. If they survive long enough, they can be uh, placed into, in general, a reserve company. The order that that happens in is uh, they join the Devastator Reserve Company, uh, so they learn all of the ranged weapons that uh, Space Marine is required to use. They then join the Assault Company, which uh, teaches them the tactics of close quarter combat and how to get where you need to be. And then once they have uh, garnered enough experience, they're placed in the Tactical Reserve Company. And then as the battle companies are diminished through losses in battle, they are replaced either into a tactical position or an assault or a devastator position. By the time you're going into a battle company, these are space marines that have seen decades of combat, decades of training. And each type of squad is led by the most senior of that type of uh, troop. So you have a, a sergeant, could be a veteran sergeant, and it's in general, it's from... Vet, the pool of veteran sergeants in the entire chapter that they're drawn into the veteran company uh, as just a, uh, as a regular veteran marine. There are then, if you can imagine, the level of um, self-sufficiency and leadership within even the most basic of the Space Marine veterans, these guys are then led by a veteran, veteran uh, uh, sergeant. And then those are the Marines that are, you know, there, there have been instances in uh, the lore where a planet was rebelling and a single squad of uh, Stern Guard veterans crashed into the, um, let's say, palace of the Imperial governor who was rebelling, 
10 veterans walked out, annihilated everyone in the palace, and suddenly the rebellion was quelled. And you didn't need to send in regiments upon regiments of uh, Imperial Guard or... Wave after wave of your own men. Of your own men, exactly right. So the space marine forces are used as a scalpel blade to cut out uh, traitors, heretics, and uh, other ne'er do wells within the Imperium. That would be you and me, Crow, wouldn't it? We just just throw oh, us in yeah. there. We'll Jesus, get like we are the elite squad, aren't we? We are like the stormtroop in yeah. A team. Exactly. They got yeah, nothing. Yeah. On and us. while we're in there, Crow will loot everything. You'll be you'll be you'll be spearheading the fucking operation. I'll be like three rooms behind, like opening all the crates. <laughs> just going, uh, yeah, I'll just take that. Off. I'll equip that. <laughs> Uh, do I need that? I'm not going to get rid of it. Ben, do you need any SMG? Out? No, okay, fine, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little help here, Crowl. So, I'll be um, like, Crowl, where are you? <laughs> there's a lot of veterans. There's a lot of veterans. Are there egos and divas? You know, is there a lot of kind of, I'm more veteran than you, pal. I can't believe you're out, you've out veteraned me. I'm not taking orders from you, you veteran. <laughs> that kind of behavior. Um, there, there, or are they kites? Y- there would be, and it's, it's, it, it's really on a, a chapter by chapter basis. Like the space wolves are uh, to a warrior, braggadocious alcoholic psychopaths. Cool. Um, braggadocious, <laughs> braggadocious. They, they like to, they like to brag. Love it. Okay. They, they are effectively space Vikings. Yeah. They love to tell their own tales and uh, the sagas of their yeah. own deeds. Got it. Uh, and they, if they like you. They will just take the piss out of you constantly and expect Bands. you to give as good as you get. Yeah, we're we're space yeah. wolves basically, aren't we? We're Grizzled, basically, basically. Bands around. But then, but then you have uh, chapters like the Dark Angels, where it's like a, almost like a, a violent Masonic lodge, where you start on the outside as a scout, and then as you go up in rank and experience, you get towards the kind of middle the central inner order of the chapter where you learn all their secrets. And so uh, a little bit and weird. And they are, yeah, they're, they're like the kind of templary, medieval Templar knight kind of idea where they're very quiet, they're very, you know, deliberate and uh, work very well cohesively. Uh, don't shout at me, people who know all about the Dark Angels. We'll get there, you sons of bitches. <laughs> is that is that the chapter of um, Lionel Richie? Lionel Richie, yeah. Lionel Richie. Yeah. Lionel Richie, yeah. Lionel Richie what? Yeah. Yeah. Lionel Richie's Johnson. What? Lionel Richie's Johnson. Oh, uh, Lionel Johnson. Is that his? Is that his? Uh, is that his entourage? Is it? He's that's his. Uh, that's Lionel his guys. L. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. They they sound boring. <laughs> It, so that legion is now literally just there is a there is a dark angels chapter and it's just a thousand yes marines. and then there are uh, acknowledged and unacknowledged successor chapters to the dark angels legion so uh, sticking with the dark angels they have um five known successors so it went from dark angels solo to then being the Angels of Absolution, the Angels of Retro- Redemption, sorry, the Angels of Vengeance, the Angels of Vigilance, and the Lion Sable. Uh, and they all inherit some aspect of the culture of the Dark Angels. They're all monastic orders focused very much on combat and keeping secrets. Some of these successor chapters. So it's an interesting combination yeah. of things, isn't it? It's just real, just bitchy. That's what they are. They're gossipy. Yeah. Oh no, hold on, that's being shit at. That's yeah. being shit at keeping secrets, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder. What, I mean, but again, what what do priests have to keep secrets about? Moving on, uh, the <laughs> sing. Hi, everybody. Hi, Apothecary Rick. Are you looking to enhance yourself with Space Marine biological upgrades, but can't afford Imperium-level prices? I, Apothecary Rick Niviera, will perform any operation for only 99 Imperium credits. We offer all procedures. Secondary heart, Lyman's ear, Neuroglottis, Hey, Mestem, 
Hima? He must man? I can never say that one. And last but not least, Black Carapace. And for a limited time only, come in for a Susan membrane and receive a free finger trap. You've tried the best, now try the rest. Call 1 400 Doctorb. The B is for bargain. So when these chapters were founded, and indeed in later foundings as well, they may have received some uh, influence from the uh, original uh, chapter that provided what's referred to as their gene seed. Now, this is the first time I'm mentioning it this so far this episode, and we will deal with it next. The thing to understand is that some successor chapters, some later foundings are done in complete isolation from the original legions. Uh, some are done in coordination with the like the Dark Angels chapter or the Imperial Fist chapter. They may get some chapter relics which they would have as a kind of focus for their um their veneration and their culture. Or indeed uh, in at least one or two cases the arms and armor that were handed to the veteran company were taken directly from the kind of stasis vaults of the original uh, Space Marine Legion. Uh, so the Dark Angels, for instance, will have significantly many more suits of power armor than they have Battle Brothers. Uh, so they give them, they gift them to uh, chapters that are founded using their gene seed. Almost... Without exception, all loyalist chapters of, of the Imperium, associated with the Imperium, have Gene Seed taken from one of the original nine loyalist legions. So technically, all chapters that exist in current day in the Imperium can have a genetic link to not only the one of the original nine Space Marine Legions, Loyalist Space Marine Legions, but also to their Primarch and to some extent to the Emperor. There is a piece of DNA in each Space Marine that is found in the Emperor. And that's really how they view the Emperor. They view him as their kind of, divine is the wrong word, but their ultimate ancestor. So during, when the when the emperor ran the Primarch project, some of his DNA was used to create the Primarchs. When the Space Marine Legions were created, they used the DNA of those infant Primarchs of the time to create baby toddler Primarchs, toddler Primarchs, uh, chibi Primarchs, I suppose we'll call them, to uh, generate the Space Marine Legions. And then the Space Marine Legions were broken up to create the chapters, the Space Ring chapters. And every time the High Lords agree to a new founding, a new series of chapters being made, the vaults are opened and the gene seed from one or more of these chapters is used to create the kind of genetic blueprint for that founding. What is a gene seed, Darren? I hear you cry or scream and weep at your... I'm going to assume radio because I'm 60. The It's not actually a seed. <laughs> it is not actually a seed. It's a Billy Jean seed. It's a Billy Jean. Boo. Fucking boo. Uh, <laughs> although uh, that was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Uh, uh, a gene seed, uh, to answer the, unan the unasked question, uh, you'll recall earlier in the episode where Chris was talking about Space Marines being able to spit acid and eat brains to gain knowledge and, and so on and so on. His favorite part of his favorite mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Up until the advent of the Primaris Marines, uh, a Space Marine, let, well, let's look at it this way. How does an individual human become a Space Marine? Great question, Ben. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Lots of training and aftermarket biological modifications. 
and a can-do attitude. A, can- a, a can-do attitude. Yes. And a stuff-me-full-of-additional-organs attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and some sticky back plastic. It starts, <laughs> yeah. it starts with where the chapter is allowed to draw recruits from. And that is uh, that changes on a chapter-by-chapter basis. I mentioned earlier there's two types of chapter. There's a crusading chapter or a fleet-based chapter, and also a planetary-based chapter where they have a home world. In general, chapters that have a home world are allowed to draw from the populace of that world plus any other habited world within their sphere of influence, their sphere of control. Fleet-based chapters, such as uh, my own personal favorite, the Black Templars, they can draw from any planet that they save, effectively. Any planet that is on their route. Sometimes... Squatters' rights. Squatters' rights, exactly. They, they can either identify a recruit in the heat of battle, uh, and if that recruit survives the battle, they are then uh, inducted into, or they begin the process of being inducted into the chapter, or in some more significant events, the Black Templars will have a small church on the planet, on a planet. Uh, and thus, if they hear of the great deeds of a possible recruit, they will go off and uh, try and recruit them. Mr. Chris? You say small temple. I mean, I bet that's relative to 40k, but it's fucking vast. I bet it can like hold a modest million people or something at any one time. In, in general... Those kinds of uh, temples, those kind of outposts for the Black Templars, some of them, yes, can be quite significant, but most will hold a single squad. They will hold up to mm. 10 uh, Marines. A chaplain, and this, this, more than a church. A chaplain, yeah. yeah okay. A chaplet. Yeah. But, yeah. but that will yeah. be as well-armoured and well-defended and fortress-like as the, the Adeptus Arbites uh, Space FBI precincts. You recall it. from our previous right. discussion. So it, it's yes, it's a church. It's also you know a strong point, a church fortress. I love how they go on recruit recruitment missions as well, like high school basketball kind of vibes. Yeah, where, like you're looking for yeah. the next talent. You know what I mean? Up yeah. and coming. I like the way you cut that guy's head off. Nice. <laughs> uh, as an example, the the space wolves recruit exclusively from the planet of Fenris, and so there are. Effectively, Viking tribes. Yeah, feral there, world. Even there are uh, death world, Chris. Death world. There are. Death um, world. I said, <laughs> you dickhead. That's what you said. I, I, obviously, it's an echo. It's a reverb. I heard it wrong. Um, <laughs> but they they will hear like the the uh, the priests uh, associated with the wolf priests, effectively, which is a mix of a chaplain and a, a medic, will hear of a battle where one of these potential recruits fought well, they'll go and see them. Uh, and even if they're dying, even if they've been mortally wounded, as long as all their wounds are on the front of their body and their deeds are authenticated, they will be inducted into the space so that that process will begin. So they could be flayed. <laughs> it means that they, yeah. turned, they turned away from the enemy and thus are not worthy but what about if they were just attacked um, from behind? Yeah, what if they were shot so hard that they spun around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously they, they, they have no tactical acumen and, were allow- and allowed themselves to be flanked. You get this kind of, as I said Got earlier, it. fascistic criteria for the induction into the space marines. Now, the thing I'm delivering... I, I've del- del- deliberately... <laughs> Deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I've deliberately left you cunts until this point is that in general your all of these oh. these recruits <laughs> all of these recruits are between nine and twelve years old. They have Eesh. to be adolescent males between nine and twelve, or prepubescent, sorry, between nine and twelve. The, the level of deed you have to commit to be recognized and considered worthy is effectively all of the Rambo movies combined. It's that level of uh, Before you uh, hit stubbornness teams. and combat and murderousness. 
that's what's needed. Before uh, you hit uh, puberty. Before you hit puberty, and then you're draw you, you begin this process into what's that? The, You've got a scratch on the back of your shoulder. Back to the uh back to nursery for you, Sonny Jim. <laughs> that's, that's it, it. now. <laughs> Pros only here, buddy. That would be that would make Put you worse, wouldn't it? You've yeah. been flayed. Just the front of you, you've been completely flayed. You're in <laughs> fucking hospital or medicville. Just like, oh my god, that was a fucking uh, and then what is it? The dark knights come in or something? Like, congratulations! You have joined <laughs> You have been fuck. selected for a life of <laughs> <What>? this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy your flaying? Because there's more <laughs> coming, Sonny. I mean, it is mostly deeds in combat. It's anything that like proves your excessiveness in terms of your survivability, your um, desire to get the job done no matter what. Uh, the can-do attitude you guys were referring I to. I retreated earlier. like a boss. I mean, on Ultramar, they have Olympic Games, which, you know, w- w- with the reward, the ultimate reward being... Uh, you're judged worthy enough to begin the induction process into the Ultramarines. The Blood Angels, for instance, on one of the moons of Ball, which is their uh, home planet, which is awash with radiation, these children have to run across if what is effectively the Sahara Desert, surviving against all the monsters and nasties that exist in that environment, and also the other... Uh, children that you're running with, the other uh, boys that you're heading to the same place. The place you're heading to is a kind of central arena called Angel's Fall, and that's where the Primarch Sanguinius fell onto the surface of the planet when the Primarchs were scattered. And there, whoever has survived has to then fight to the death. And whoever is left standing they don't automatically become a space marine. They get a chance to become a space marine. It's um, it's battle royale, isn't it? Less yeah. the kind of Japanese school children and kind of rucksacks full of random weapons. Hey, but the Imperium's a big place. It takes many forms. Well, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So the process of being drawn in from a, a recruit to then becoming a scout. We alluded to the number of uh, additional organs and glands and biochemical kind of assets that are placed into your body. We'll talk about those in more detail when we actually deep dive into the, the space marines and each chapter in turn. But in general, there are 19 separate biological elements that are placed into the child's body between the ages of 10 to the age of about 18. Some of them can be done in groups of two and three. Most of the important ones have to be put in place before the child goes through puberty. This vastly increases their bone density, the size of their bones, the strength of their muscles, how they process poisons, and they get things like a second heart is put in uh, to increase efficiency. They get an extra lung put in so they can breathe in various toxic formats. They have a lot of uh, kind of monitoring glands put in that can you know, help with being in hostile environments. Yeah. That kind of a tremendous low light vision. You mentioned some earlier about uh, spitting acid uh, and uh, eating brain matter and absorbing the kind of recent memories of whatever that creature thought. Uh, Does it have to be brain matter? Could they? Could they? Could they like chew on a finger and <laughs> and sense what that alien had just touched? Or do you know what I mean? <laughs> this guy hasn't used toilet paper in three weeks. <laughs> this guy has been secretly fingering his friend. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It ranges from those kind of biological, uh, strictly biological and uh, internal kind of monitoring to more esoteric things like the Susan membrane, which uh, is a gland placed in their body. And once it's uh, accepted within that process, they can sweat. I'm sorry, Ben, I'm going to have to do it. They can sweat out an amniotic sac 
that covers their body, Ooh. like sticks to their body, like skin tight, and they go into suspended animation, and and it protects them against uh, up to uh, exposure to like uh, raw vacuum of space, uh, as opposed to wow. the cooked vacuum of space. I don't know. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> they are vacuum packed themselves. Yeah. <laughs> How long yeah. does that process take? Like, do you have to have that before you go into space? Or can you just be like chucked out an airlock and then you're like, oh shit. And then you squeeze and it just goes. It, it, it just can be quite pop. rapid. <laughs> it, it's it, space marines are, <laughs> there's so much invested in a single space marine that it can happen within minutes. Uh, wow. And so, okay. you know, to protect like the. Sneeze. Um, yeah, you can run <laughs> run up yeah. behind someone with a paper bag, go pop, and it's like that's the <laughs> instinctive reaction, <laughs> like the like the fainting goats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like a, a dinner party or something, just fall off a chair. <laughs> um, question about so once they've undergone all these uh, um, procedures, do they still look without their armor and whatnot, do they still look human or do they still look human at a glance? Would you still recognize them or do they look vastly different now? Great question. In general, they look like an Olympic grade bodybuilder. They're all at least six foot tall. Uh, sure. And many, uh, many average between six, six and seven foot. They're like, they're insanely strong uh, compared to a baseline human. In terms of physical changes, it talks about the blood angels. There's so much radiation they have to get through to get to angels fall that, you know, they're, sk they're covered in lesions and cancers. As part of the process of transforming from a, a scabby looking child into a blood angel, they have all of their uh, organs placed in almost at once i think there's a couple of phases they have to go through but they get they're basically just crammed in like a hot pocket uh, and mm. then they're put they're put into a coffin for a year and as they're in that coffin the blood the genetic kind of trigger of sanguineous is pushed through their system and that transforms them from these scabby-looking mutant children. They're not mutants, but scabby-looking uh, radioactive children. And they come out looking like muscle-bound supermodels because wow. uh, Sanguinius's DNA rewrites their DNA to make it the most perfect version of what that child could be. Wow. Eugenics. It's eugenics. Yeah. So they pump his blood into them when they're in the coffin is that what you meant they pump uh, a, they pump a solution that includes some of sanguinius's blood through through their right. body and that that kind of strong primark blood rewrites helps to rewrite their dna but it takes a year and they're in a coffin for a year and is that why they're called the blood angels uh no they're called the blood angels because uh sanguinius had angel wings do you remember? He was one of the. He's the only yes. kind of mutated one. Yeah, but I, 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 sorry, it was. It wasn't so much the angels aspect. It was the blood aspect. I was asking about. I don't know. <laughs> Let's say yes. I love that we were talking about blood. I asked what that was, and you gave me the answer as if it was angels. <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah. Sanguinius definitely had wings. That makes sense. But yeah, yeah okay. Mr. Chris, um, how much blood must Sanguinius donate? I mean, there's a lot of space marines, even if it is just a little bit. Milk him like a cow. He's been dead for thousands of years, but it's it, you know it's half a thimbleful within this solution that's pushed through uh, their uh, bodies. Still, it's so it's like still that, incredibly it must need a powerful. A lot of blood, though. Yeah, you still need a lot of blood, though. Yeah, but that solution that solution is kept in stasis. It's like a catalyst. It doesn't change. Oh, it's like yogurt. You just put one bit of yogurt in there and then it f keeps like manufacturing itself almost. I like the analogy. I'm going to go with kind of Space Marine sourdough. Space Marine sourdough, yeah. You got your starter. It's a starter. Yeah. 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 yeah got it. Yeah, yeah. You just keep adding to it. Got it. Okay, yeah. cool. It's the first 18 of those 19 implants 
uh, are required to have been done successfully, to have been accepted by the body successfully for that kind of in, uh, initiate to become a scout. The final implant is done when they are elevated from being a scout to being a space marine of some uh, variation within the, 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 the chapters. In terms of them becoming a scout, it's really then when the, the kind of hardcore indoctrination into the culture of the chapter and the battle tactics, tactics of the chapter take place. They will have gone through training, kind of physical training, but in a kind of medicinal fashion. Everything is done to help them kind of accept the implants. For those who reject the implants, there is one of three options available to them. The first is an agonizing, mutating death. The second is a lobotomy and being uh, turned into a monotask servitor. And the final is being turned into a servant of some kind within the chapter. Those really are the only three options for anyone who fails at any point along that indoctrination process. Um, well, but what in terms of the third option, what would have to happen in terms of failing? It, there has to be some sort of middle ground, like the organs. Uh, yeah, take, yes, it's not a bio. It, it, it wouldn't. Yeah, it wouldn't be a biological failing. It would be almost like a cultural failing. They failed to live up to the standards of the Space Marine chapter, although they have accepted all of the organs, so thus we're not going to waste them. They have an opportunity to be of service to the chapter, uh, either as some sort of administrative uh, element within the organization or a crew for some aspect of their space vessels. So they could be like basically physically bar the final implant a space marine but failed on some technicality and so they're now just a servant. So you get like space marine sized human beings. <laughs> yes. Serving tea and scones. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's an interesting take. The final implant is something called, or sorry, the final two implants. The first is the the progenoids, which is the gene seed we have discussed previously. And what that is, it's two small kind of walnut-sized uh, implants, one in the neck and one in the crotch, and it absorbs the genetic material from all the other implants that the uh, initiate has had, and it stores enough raw material from each to be able to regrow each organ for a new, uh, a new initiate. So the, that's what's referred to as the gene seed. It's the genetic seed of all of the implants that all of the 17 implants that the that the chapter uses to be able to create a scout right from them from them so each chapter holds uh, in the apothecaryon their kind of medical uh, area a stasis chamber with dozens of these gene seeds space marine chapters are also required by the inquisition to submit a gene seed sample, uh, you know, at various times to be able to have it tested for mutation. And they also have to send some to the Adeptus Terra so that the High Lords can use them to create a new Space Marine chapter when it is required. Love that. They just get like the Primark, give them a magazine, put them in a closed closet <laughs> what? with a fucking and pop out the neck. Box. Yeah. Just, like, <laughs> just uh <laughs> just come out when you're ready <laughs> just make sure you get it all in the tupperware box okay yeah all in the tupperware box. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get it in the fridge asap you you know a little bit too much about this chris we're moving on um <laughs> in general these uh progenoid glands are only removed when a space marine dies each apothecary has a specialized piece of equipment that looks like a very kind of wide, flat hoover 
that they ram into the neck and the crotch of a, a dying space, dying or dead space marine, and it sucks out the gland uh, and it the stores old. them in, in a small little stasis vial, which then can be used to create new space marines or to pay the tithe or to have it examined for How mutation. How undignified. <laughs> like... Oh, it's, do, se- do it's seen as the ultimate gift that a space marine can give to the chapter. It, the right. the progenoid glands, what you want. each one it's fucking will grow enough material to create two new, potentially two new space marines. Right. So there's a constant kind of the final sacrifice, as it were, the emperor's mercy, as it's known. And uh, the inquisitor, the inquisition, are they? testing it for mutations because this is essentially like a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy exactly right yeah does it degrade over time then some of them can degrade some of them can mutate uh the space wolves is a great example because one of their glands the mutation ends up with them having fangs like wolf fangs instead of uh, regular teeth there's a chapter called the black dragons who end up with uh, blades of bone coming out of their forearms uh, and so their their armor has holes in it that allows these bone bony blades to stick out and they use them in cool. combat but they're still judged as being loyalist uh, there's been a number of cases where uh, some combination of uh, progenoid mutation or a kind of sin against the ecclesiarchy has required the Space Marine chapter to be completely destroyed because the chances of it turning to the worship of chaos because of the mutation is quite high. So, yeah. So, once an initiate goes from being a scout to being an actual battle brother, an actual Space Marine battle brother, they are uh, given the final implant, which is called the Black Carapace. They're effectively flayed alive, not awake, flayed alive and a thin layer of um, a kind of psychoactive neural network sheeting is placed between between their skin and the actual muscle muscle tissue uh, and some muscle. sensors are placed <laughs> muscle uh, some <laughs> sensors are placed into their kind of central nervous system and that's done because it allows the power armor to interact directly with their central nervous system. And so Mental. they they don't feel their armor. They don't feel the weight of their armor. Uh, they're able to operate as uh, swiftly as they can without it, or with it as without it. They can body pop like they were wearing nothing Exactly at all, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it also means that they... There, if you've seen a space marine helmet, it looks like it's got eyes. Those aren't eyes. Those are a series of cameras behind lenses. There's no visor on the inside of a space marine's helmet. Uh, the it's armor uh, communicates communicates <laughs> that uh, visual signal directly into their central nervous system. That seems easy just to punch a couple of holes in it and have eyes. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the cameras allow them to see in ultraviolet light, yeah, the cameras, thermal bra. vision. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Technology. Sure, sure, sure. Technology. <laughs> but it also interacts not only with their power armor, but also with their weaponry. And so the, the basic weapons of a space marine are uh, bolt weapons, uh, a bolt gun or bolt pistol. Uh, these fire bolts. Uh, rounds called bolts which are mass reactive grenades so you shoot one of these uh, bullets in quotes at an enemy it hits them the sensors in the round register that it's stuck in something and then it explodes so it's it, it's one of these things you see it a lot in the kind of the visualization of uh, space marines in combat it People just explode when they shoot them, uh, and that's down to them firing small grenades rather than bullets. How big are the rounds? Uh, they're about uh, they're about the size of two fingers. They're not small, right. <laughs> like a buckshot. Or that's something. two fingers, one on top of the other, not end to end, side to side. Oh yeah, <laughs> fucking, yeah. it's the small battle like bus a, again, like a sh- like a shotgun shell, that kind of size. So like like two <laughs> yeah. buses. 
Yeah. Scissoring, <laughs> basically. Um, so so that's like what? Uh, like 20 or 30 mil? 20 or 30 mil? Yeah. Years? 20? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the issue that I have when I, when I look oh, at here we go. the imagery for, for, for Space Marines is you, you see them like in games and in videos and, you know, on, on, in imagery, just fucking hosing, just absolutely hosing. But the clips for their guns are, they're not big. Like where, where the fuck are they storing all the ammo? Well, it's a well-known fact that the magazines for each bolt gun are based on the technology that's similar to the TARDIS and Doctor Who. So it's a lot mm-hmm. bigger mm-hmm. inside the clips than it is in the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fine, I'll accept it. I will accept it. <laughs> there are pistol versions of such weapons, but the main one looks like a, a, an assault rifle, effectively, a kind of heavy assault rifle. They then have fragmentation and armor-piercing grenades uh, and also a combat knife. That's the kind of bog-standard tactical marine. You then have the other rope. marines... Don't underestimate a length of rope when you're out, in the, out in the field. Oh, mate, yeah. They've got whips. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of other uh, marines are equipped with chainsaws, which are chainsaws. Chainsaws... Effectively, a sword that is a chainsaw. Yeah, uh, that's one more time. And that, I can picture that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, it is just a chainsaw. It may look, yeah. it may take the shape of a sword, but it's more of a chainsaw than anything, isn't it? At that point, I mean, it's exactly just a chainsaw right. in a yeah. different format. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it sounds yeah. better. Chain sword, ord, ord. Yeah. Again, what I love in all the games, especially in the like the Space Marine games is that when a chain sword hits another sword and they both stay exactly where they are instead of one whipping down towards the hill the, the <laughs> yeah. chainsaw yeah, yeah, yeah. as it would yeah <laughs> and, and for the vast majority of space marines that's the only weapons they will ever need a bolt gun a bolt pistol some grenades and a chain sword there are other variations of these kinds of weapons uh, heavier versions you've got the heavy bolter which fires even larger rounds of ammunition, Ben, from even bigger magazines. Uh, but then you've got LAS cannons, plasma cannons, missile launchers. You have something called a we grab got uppers gun. Downwards. Uppers <laughs> downwards. <laughs> Green ones, red ones, small ones, smelly ones. We got stinky ones. <laughs> you make it sound like yeah. um, it's kind of a modest kind of loadout, bolt gun, a couple of these and a bit of that. But actually, yeah. you could fucking cause some damage with all of that shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could cause some yeah, mayhem. Yeah, yeah. You could ruin someone's day with yeah, that. But, yeah, but only for, in reality, about five seconds, and then your ammunition runs out. Because, let's be honest... <laughs> uh, only because you like to use everything all at once. You're like, all the grenades yeah. and all the rounds and all the chainsaws. <laughs> okay. Chris, have you got any spare grenades, mate? No, you should have <laughs> well, uh, ben, I'll irritate you, Ben. In the uh, in the game Bolt Gun, your uh, Bolt Gun can have up to two hundred rounds of ammunition at any one time. <laughs> of course it can. And the magazine and it is still like... hasn't saved. It still hasn't saved me from dying every six minutes. <laughs> in that fucking yeah. game, I just get. I was thinking of. I mean, it's not. I'm not. I'm not. You know. I'm not criticizing the size of magazine. I'm just criticizing the fact that when you see a space marine, <laughs> he's able to hold reload. the enemy for like half an hour nonstop. Yeah. But where the where the fuck are the rest of the magazines? Like, if he was able to do that and he's firing off two hundred rounds a minute, they you just he'd need another marine with him, just <laughs> covered in bandoliers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, some of the other more specialized weapons include grav weaponry, gravity or graviton uh, beam projectors, which increases the local gravity of anything it hits uh, exponentially. So you could be you could be walking along uh, kind of in your kind of relatively heavy armor and you could get absolutely smushed into the ground. Uh, they're really good against heavily heavy infantry and vehicles because nice. you can shoot you can shoot a tire you can shoot one tire on a vehicle which then is suddenly 
it feels like it has the gravity of Jupiter on it, uh, and you're basically just driving <laughs> in circles. Uh, and then I believe you the gravity of Jupiter isn't that isn't that great. But anyway, I would love it if you have like an inverse, like you have a blow mode, so it's like just no gravity. <laughs> that would be so much fun. <laughs> Kral, it's absolutely enormous. the The gravity of Earth is nine point eight oh seven. And gravity is twenty. Uh, the gravity on Jupiter is twenty four point seven nine meters per second squared. I, d- I don't know why it is it meters per second as acceleration. Squared. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Good, because it's gravity, mate. Yeah. Is, is that, that is that uh, terminal uh, velocity okay. or something? <laughs> I would have thought it would be like newtons, you know, like force rather than is it the speed of the speed of the result of gravity? It's, it's the same power as dropping twenty four. Isaac Newton's out of a tree onto an apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, <laughs> twice, Kral. So, yeah, it's, that Dar was right. Cool. Dar was right. I don't know. I was just guessing. <laughs> anyway, so that's the kind of basic arms uh, and armor for the tactical assault and devastator marines, but also for the some of the veterans. You then get into tactical dreadnought armor or terminator armor. And this is the... This is the the super heavy armor that close quarter specialists wear, and they're all veterans. So this armor allows you to survive not only in the kind of void, the vacuum of space, but also within the kind of close confines of spaceships and of hive cities, anywhere you need to go to be able to um, mince up some enemies uh, and end a rebellion before it starts. There's two kind of... All-terrain armor. Yeah, I want to say, use the word exciting. There's two exciting aspects to Terminator armor. The first is they have teleport homers in them. That allows them to be used teleport (laughs) technology (laughs) uh, from any battle barge or strike cruiser into the heart of battle. So effectively, you bamf into battle in as a walking tank and then fuck shit up. The other thing is that there is a spiritual aspect to the protection that, that Terminator armor provides because in the left pauldron, left shoulder pad of Terminator armor, the, the kind of symbol of Terminator armor is this stone skull. And in that skull is a sliver of the armor of the emperor. So the emperor's armor that was taken off of him when he was put into the golden throne was effectively shredded. And each little sliver provides spiritual and actual protection to uh, a space marine in dread in Terminator armor, uh, which means that they are somewhat resistant to Uh, psychic powers although that's not the main benefit the main benefit is that it gives a type of force field around uh, the terminator uh, which allows them to survive from hits and damage and weapons that would normally obliterate them completely wow so it's not just when you said like actual protection it's not like it's not like the emperor armor version of like the gideon bible that you had in your breast pocket <laughs> yeah, yeah. that stopped the single bullet that passed through your shirt. It's actually a well placed <laughs> slither of armor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You are really, really well protected as long as the bullet hits you right in the quadrant. You know? <laughs> so that that in a nutshell, I, I can hear people pulling their hair out, or describing. You've not described this. You've not described that. In a nutshell, that's what a space marine chapter is. That's what the process of becoming a space marine uh, is. Until recently, that was the only way space marines were made. There is now a new way that space marines uh, exist, and that those are the primaris space marines. Uh, these are space marines that are literally head and shoulders above regular space marines. So the regular space marines are now referred to as firstborn. They're the firstborn space marines. The primaris marines are referred to, uh, and we'll see if you're surprised by this, they're um, referred to as third primaris space marines. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) The advent of the primaris uh, space marines 
really is, again, finds its origins in the Horus heresy. Immediately after the end of the Horus heresy, almost as uh, he was inflicting the Codex Astartes on his brother Primarchs, Robuti Guliman also went to uh, one of the kind of most um, well-renowned uh, for the time um, agents of the Mechanicum, uh, a, a mage priest called Belisarius Call, and he asked him, or in fact ordered him, to create an improved version of the Space Marines uh, that could be used by the Emperor because, you know, fully half of the Space Marines went traitor and at least two-thirds of them still existed at the end of the heresy. Uh, so the there were more traitor Space Marines alive than there were regular Space Marines. So they needed a force uh, to compete against that and overcome them. Um what Belisarius Call did was create uh, the Primaris program, very much like the Primark program, the Primaris program, where it was Space Marine Plus. It was like the paywall edition of Space Marines. Um, and thus, uh, over the space of millennia, he worked not only on improving the Gene Seed program for Space Marines, improving the armor, improving the weaponry and vehicles available to uh, Space Marines. Um, he also physically changed uh, Space Marines that were alive, Space Marines from the original Space Marine Legions, converted them into Primaris Space Marines and put them into uh, suspended animation uh, while he worked on the equipment and the training regimens and, and, and. This didn't bear fr fruit until 10,000 years after the Horus Heresy, until effectively 25 years before present day in 40K. Uh, in well, in ninth edition, uh, for box fresh, are they? They are new, new. They are new, new, and uh, their kind of arrival uh, cleft the Imperium in twain, which had already been cleft in twain by the uh, the Great Rift. So, the main kind of differences between firstborn space marines and primaris space marines uh, first of all the gene seed is different the primaris have another three additional glands including a gland that introduces uh, metal into their musculature so that they are they are literally their their muscles are literally corded steel or as strong as corded steel. Wow. There are another couple in there that we'll uh, discuss when we uh, delve a little bit deeper into them, but there's an additional process to go through to become a Primaris Space Marine. They also have significantly larger armor. If you take a firstborn Space Marine and stand a Primaris Space Marine next to them, the Primaris is about a foot taller. Holy shit. And on the on the tabletop, it's quite an impressive difference. Primaris Space Marines, in general, tend to be purely focused on one form of combat. There are various flavors of Space Marine, but the basic ones are referred to as the Intercessor. And that is a, a, a tactical Space Marine on steroids. Uh, the other basic flavor is the Assault Intercessor, uh, and that is an assault space marine on steroids. There are then various types of support troop, including the Inceptor, which is a Primaris space marine in heavy armor on steroids. With huge, oh. On steroids with huge <laughs> jet with a huge jetpack, wielding two heavy bolters with no magazines. Then, fuck yeah, of course. <laughs> Where does he get the bullets? Where does he get the bullets? 
He just makes them up as he goes along. Well, do you know what I thought when I this I, when I was looking at that? I was like, maybe there's some sort of like weird like black hole thing inside that's able to just like generate <laughs> ammunition on the fly. Like that would be <laughs> dope. Why have they? That's just it? far out, mate. Nope. That's just weird. That's just Fuck, sci-fi. Mate, I am far. You've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> but in ter- in terms of the um, types of Primaris Marine. There are kind of three types available. One is referred to as the Awoken, uh, and these are the space marines that transcended to become um, uh, Primaris marines at the end of the Horus Heresy, which meant that you you now in the Warhammer 40k universe have space marine warriors that that fought in the Horus Heresy. They are alive and angry in the Imperium of Man. The second type then is the indoctrinated, and these are the ones that go through the full process uh, of um, uh, organ uh, implantation and training. They start as a general recruit, an ordinary kind of 10-year-old child, and then go through the full process to become a, a Primaris Marine. The final one is... Something of a controversial topic amongst the gaming community. And they are referred to as the Ascended. The the Ascended are firstborn space marines that go through an extremely painful process to become Primaris marines. So you can convert wow. existing space marines upgrade. to Primaris space marines. Don't use the word upgrade around them. They'll kick you right in the head. Um wow. What you find in general is that it's veterans, but also uh, command staff that go through the process to become uh, Primaris Space Marines. And that process is also referred to as crossing the Rubicon Primaris. There's a 60% attrition rate. You either become a Primaris Space Marine or you die on the table. So the more... uh, how should we say, specialised types of space marines we'll leave to next episode. And that includes the Death Watch, the Grey Knights, and tangentially, the Custodes as well. Um, um, oh, excellent. Wow. wow. Wowzers. Kral, space marine. if yes. you were going to have an additional organ, what would yep. it be? An extra earlobe. For what purpose? <laughs> um, to have more than two earlobes. <laughs> <laughs> I would. What? So out of all of the, out of all the stuff, Crow, you could have basically. a million earlobes. It will not help your your you pay attention. Oh no, mate! No, 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 no. Are you saying okay? What modification would I have out of the choice of what the space marines have to them, like? Or not. Or, or one or not. Any, any modification. Okay, yep. well, Spitting Venom's going to be one of them, isn't it? That's fucking brilliant for no reason whatsoever. Um, <laughs> You're going to use then, that then, in your then, day-to-day then. life. I'd have you? the black carapace, but I'd want the armor with it. Those are my terms. Yeah. <laughs> Those are my terms. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. terms. What about you, Ben? <laughs> what would you have, Ben? <laughs> I want the black carapace bit, hold the armor. Uh, I'm okay. For that. Just, <laughs> just want to be flayed. <laughs> yeah, just just flay me. Put me in some sort of amniotic sack. Put my skin back on. Good to go. He wants the thing where, like, if you scare him, he just goes into an amniotic sack. <laughs> like, that's yeah, his yeah. natural reaction. <laughs> <laughs> you scare him by just fainting goat. It's like, oh, and then just fall over. <laughs> uh, uh, what about you, Darren? How many toes would you uh, like? How many extra think, toes do you want? No, I think I'd have uh, an ink sack, like a squid. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so you could escape dangerous situations. There. Uh, basically, I'd, 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 I'd look like a pallid Zoidberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and make run. that sound as you run away. <laughs> Vic's just so embarrassed. Oh, I, I, I'm so. I'm so. Uh, this doesn't normally happen. Like this is. <laughs> She'd have to carry like a load of wet wipes with her all the time. I can only apologise. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a compliment in his in his culture. It's a compliment. It's a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
so next next uh, episode is the like specialized marines. Yeah, specialized right. marines and others. Yeah. Oh mate, cannot wait. Right, I'm gonna wrap up. All right, mate. Why is it cold? Hey. <laughs> All right, that's all from us. Thank you so much for listening. Details and imagery for the topics we've discussed in this podcast can be found on our website at layingdownthelore.com. We also have all our previous episodes on there, release schedules, merchandise, and you can sign up for the Laying Down the Lore newsletter, which includes exclusive info about upcoming releases, behind-the-scenes chat, and some extra lore not covered in the podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard in this episode and you want to support us, head over to patreon.com forward slash laying down the lore 40k and sign up today for as little as three pounds. This will give you access to our Discord so you can come and tell us exactly what you think of Kral and his earlobes. We'll be back again soon displaying just how little Chris and I know. Until then, goodbye. See you later, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Toodaloo! Thank you.